Sure, you know, virtual reality is fun, and there are 10,000 games available to everybody with an iPod, but we're going to have to get into non-virtual reality again, into the real situation, because if tomorrow your community is flooded out or burned down or whatever, and these climate disasters will increase in frequency, and we will be facing the sea level rise, the backup of sewage in our cities and things, we're going to have to be available. We, can't, we won't be able to sit at the iPod all day playing games. We're going to have to be available to each other. Well, one of the images that stuck with me from your book was when you talked about the, um, I think the Earth, Earth has been going for four and a half billion years now. Mm -hmm. And if we put that sequentially within a, tw within a 24 hour period, um, the early bacterial life started at dawn um, and they kept they were the dominant species if you like mm -hmm. until midday and then the human human beings came along at one minute to midnight mm -hmm. and then so-called evolved human beings came along or developed at one second to midnight yes. and that just shows you in the life of the earth yes. how short okay. our time is here and yet what an incredible impact we've had both good and bad on the earth Right, we're a blip on the screen, aren't we? <laughs> in a we sense, are. we are. Yeah. In the, from a very large perspective, we yeah. are. But we're in this wonderful moment, this wonderful instant of our evolutionary history where we make it or break it. We can either, you know, suffer from, from climate refugees. And um, I was saying to a friend the other day, we were, where I live on the island of Mallorca in Spain which has lost its, its self-sufficiency in food and energy in 40 years only, uh, a mass addiction to tourism. It's cheap and easy to get to Mallorca from anywhere in Europe. And so we built huge airport at sea level, and we now import 90% of our food and energy rather than creating it on the island. And people say, well, if we build a green economy, then the North Africans will come over and take it away from us because they'll be starving. And I said, well, we'd better send consultants there now for them to help them green their economy while we green ours. We have to think systemically, and we have to work locally. Um, one of my very favorite stories is a real experience I had in China in 1974, visiting a place called Red Flag Canal which had, was an area of China, a huge desert valley with a couple hundred villages that were dying of drought. And the young people there proposed that they bring water across a mountain range from the nearest river. Government engineers trudged the mountain, said flat out impossible. Now, these young people had very little education and had no money whatsoever for doing this project. But as soon as the engineers went away, they began to smelt red iron out of the dry earth of their valley floor. China had been told at this time that the U.S. was going to bomb them back into the Stone Age. And there was a huge motivational campaign to be able to recreate civilization from scratch uh, in the country of China. So they were inspired by this. It's human work that gets things done. It's and hard work, though, isn't it? It's hard, hard work. Hard physical they work. They had to smelt the iron yeah. out of their dry red earth and make simple tools, shovels, pickaxes, and then hammers and chisels to chop blocks of stone because they were going to have to build aqueducts across valleys the way the Romans did without heavy yeah. machinery. And then homemade dynamite. I interviewed the Iron Girls dynamite team that had blasted tunnels through the mountains. Yeah. And this is the most spectacular irrigation system in the world now. It had been completed shortly before I got there in 1974, and they had black and white movies showing how the kids swung off the cliffs on homemade rope, chipping in the first ledge on a dry, barren mountainside, right, in their dry, barren villages. And uh, when that first water came through, it was a miracle to people. Yeah. And every time it falls three feet, meanwhile, they'd learned from the county school how to make a little generator. They made electricity. That whole valley now is green and lush and a tourist attraction where they, it's, it's become a national pride heritage site. 
Now, when I talk to Chinese MBA students today, they say, why would they do that for no money? You see, the motivation yeah. was very high. This was life or death. Yes. And we will face such situations. Yes. And still I thrill at the fact that we are going to learn to do miracles the way those Chinese kids did, even if we have to start from scratch, which is unlikely, because while there's a disaster here, there won't be one there, and we can cooperate through the Internet, share the information, help each other, move around. We've got pipeline technologies. I tell oil companies, your future is going to be moving water around. Uh, we won't need oil anymore. We have endless kinds of alternative clean energies to draw on, whether it's geothermal or wind or w solar and whatever else young people will, will invent. And I say, I know you don't all want to become organic farmers, the young people. So he, be technologists. Do, do high-tech stuff, but make sure it's 100% recyclable and make sure that you don't put any toxins in it. And then you're free to invent whatever you want lightweight buildings, grow the plants to make cars out of, fuel them on water. You know, it's a, it's a wide open future for living better on a hotter planet.